Welcome everybody to the We Are All Related series. I'll uh, talk about today's speaker in a few minutes, but we thought that we would start with a little prayer, which Pat um, was kind enough to say that she would lead. So Pat. Thank you, Luann. Hi, Dorian. Welcome. Thank uh, you for taking time to be with us. And everybody else, too, thank you for being here this afternoon. I'm going to read a poem from Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, it's titled Morning of Peace, but I'm just going to take the liberty to say Afternoon of Peace. And um, you may want to close your eyes because it's a, a poem that has different reflections on nature kind of more of a meditative poem. So whatever you feel right about or feel good about. So <clears throat> let's just take a few deep breaths in and let go of anything that might be troubling us or heavy on us or we wish to just release with the in-breath, take in all that you need for this time together and release anything that you wish to just put aside for for a little while. I'd just like to acknowledge the poet Thich Nhat Hanh, and um, though he has passed, um, he's really with us. The spirit resides with us always. So I want to say a word of gratitude. So his poem is a morning of peace. I'm changing it to afternoon of peace. Treading the path that leads to the moon, I look back and can't stop marveling. I see a bubble of water on the immense ocean of space. It is the earth, our green planet, her sumptuous beauty sparkling and proud, yet oh so fragile. In her, I discover myself. Walking mindfully on the earth, a grassy path, my feet make the promise to embrace this early afternoon and touch the peace of this present moment. Reflecting on autumn leaves as they fall and cover the path, unrolling a carpet of walking meditation, a shy squirrel hiding behind the oak tree looks at me surprised, then dashes to the top of the tree and disappears behind a cluster of leaves. I see a clear stream flowing between cracks in the rocks, its water laughing while the trees whistle. Together we celebrate this afternoon of peace. At the same time, I see places of deep suffering where men and women imprison each other and make each other suffer. The ways of discrimination, hatred and greed, inevitable causes of catastrophe crush upon the earth. Chicks of the same hen wear different colors in order to fight with each other. Heart-rending cries declare the horrors of war. Sisters and brothers, the beautiful earth is us. I embrace her and hold her tenderly against my breast. Breathing together in the same rhythm, we restore our calm, our peace. Let us accept ourselves so we may accept one another. Let us share the vision and make it possible for great love to arise. Thank you, Pat. Mm -hmm. um, again, good afternoon, everybody. I would like to introduce Dorian um, officially. Dorian Ortega is a licensed clinical professional counselor and founder of Fly Radical Therapy, LLC. First, love yourself. Radical Therapy is a mental health practice featuring therapeutic approaches 
centering biracial indigenous and people of color and LGBTQI plus individuals and loving yourself through collective social liberation awareness, healing for yourself with each other and helping others to achieve the same. So I Radical Therapy is inspired by liberation, womanist and multicultural psychology. Dorian is also co-founder of Healing Hodonas, Hodonex, meaning agitator in Puerto Rican, is a Puerto Rican word. Hodonex organizes a series of free poetry, healing circles, and other events that seek to use art as a culturally relevant, accessible, and inclusive tool of expression, education, resistance, and community healing in Humboldt Park. The practice is housed at the Honeycomb Network, a co-working network space for creatives. In partnership with Siempre Contigo Incorporated, the practice collaborated on forming a pilot program for youth and young adults called the HEAL, Honey Education and Love, on Academy, where youth are paid to participate in a four-part series of workshops on mental health, mental wellness, and healing practices. Dorian is a facilitator, curates and organizes the program, connections the, the facilitators, recruits the youth participants, and manages mental health resources. Dorian is a program curator, workshop facilitator, and has presented for speaking engagements on radical wellness and practice at elementary and high schools, universities, and organizations. Part of the dynamic way wellness can be practiced is in exercises. The workshops and presentations usually include education history, a practice skill, and is meant to be accessible for folks to continue to integrate within their environments. Dorian is also an advocate for mental health accessibility and social justice. Dorian and the pra practice are, on, are registered with coffee, hip hop, and mental health who run a co coffee shop that funds free mental health services for multicultural individuals. Dorian is also a member of the board of directors for the Latinx Union in Chicago, which advocates for migrants and undocumented workers. She also serves on the Encuentros Latinx Advisory Committee for Spiritual LGBTQ plus leaders and participates in a community advisory council for a Latina mother and teen sexual health education research study led by the University of Illinois at Chicago and Centro Romero. On a personal note, um, I would just like to share with you that Dory and I worked together at Presence Behavioral Health in Melrose Park, Illinois for a number of years. And um, what I remember most about Dorian is that the two of us, when we were finished with clients around eight or 8.30 at night would often get together and solve the world's problems. And uh, we didn't quite get there, but we made a lot of progress over the years. And <laughs> I have really appreciated Dorian as a friend and a professional and just an outstanding um, human being uh, who contributes to our society in, in any number of ways and um, had kind of lost touch with her. And I'm really happy, Dorian, that you said yes to being with us this afternoon in our learning process. And uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to share with us. So you're up. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Luann, for inviting me. Um, I'm very grateful to see you again and to continue to stay connected even after all these years. <laughs> um, thank you all for taking the time and space with intention to discern on this topic. Um, I uh, I am a, I think I, I just said this the other day to someone, maybe a recovering Christian in connection to church. And so I've been in a spiritual journey for the last couple of years, but I was born and raised in a United Church of Christ church and was very involved in uh, programming and Christian education and uh, lay, being a lay person. Um, and what I remember, <clears throat> the la one of the last projects I worked on before, uh, maybe not attending the church as often as I, as I used to, um, we were a part of a discernment process called um, 
open and affirming. I don't know if some folks are familiar with the process under United Church of Christ. I saw some heads nod when I said that, so I wasn't sure, but um, <clears throat> the United Church of Christ, are, so, are folks familiar with that organization? Yeah, so um, they have a process called ONA, which is open and affirming. Um, and this process is an encouraged process to uh, go through as a church, as a congregation, to um, become an open and affirming church, meaning op intentionally open to uh, folks who identify as LGBTQ+, um, as well as affirming, so not just um, letting people in the door, um, but also openly advocating for um, LGBTQ plus folks and, and uh, ideally creating safe space for them to feel welcome. <clears throat> and so um, I, I was part of that process with my church and um, the church that I grew up in is a Puerto Rican led church, Spanish speaking. Um, and so part of that process was with a, a person who identified as a, a white woman who was doing her, um, I think it's called, um, she was doing a maybe a service project with our church as a part of her uh, process to become a, a pastor. And so she spent a year with us and part of the last year of her um, or last few months of her uh working with us, she helped to lead us through this um, discernment process. Um, I just wanted to share how helpful it was to take that intentional time to workshop, to watch documentaries, to connect in a culturally competent way, folks from the church to this topic, um, and to also be mindful about how we were representing our church and, and also be mindful about the congregation and membership and how challenging it was to have mixed um, membership, people who have different beliefs. Um, and then also beautiful to have witnessed that we were able to vote, that this was uh, open, that we wanted to be an open and affirming church and became one of the first from uh, Latinx um, or at least Latino identified churches from UCC that was able to do that. So I, I wanted to share in gratitude before I began to honor and really encourage that this process is taking place. <clears throat> I, I'm thankful to be invited because I think it is such an important part of how we create systemic change is when we get to do that first line that you have here on your um, on this on one of the statements um, is to listen. Um, and I think discernment is about listening and being in stillness um, and allowing space for yourself to see where things are held in the body. And so as I as, as Lan mentioned in the, the bio, uh, one of the things I really enjoy about doing presentations is really engagement. I know we only have a, uh, this hour together, so I really do like to engage with you all um, because I think it's more impactful when we're leaving with something to be really present and mindful with um, as we're learning. And so I'm going to do a check-in <clears throat> with some of you uh, who are invited and you can share if you'd like to, you do not have to, if you don't want to. Um, you can also type in a chat. So there's various ways. You can also write it down and maybe post it like this. Um, however you wanna answer is totally up to you. <clears throat> when I say the word, so I'm gonna say, and I'm gonna ask a question and I'd like for you to take a moment, maybe even 30 seconds to a minute to just check in from head to toe. So heart, I'm sorry, head, <clears throat> heart, and body. So when I ask you this question, I would welcome you to sit with it and allow you to understand where it is that you are holding the answer to this question or even the question itself. So when I ask this question of how does oppression against a sexual minority 
make you feel? Would anyone like to share? Where is that question as I ask it in your body? Where's a sensation? And feel free to unmute yourself and share. This is Sandy Rotemeyer. I can see you, but you can't see me, and I don't know why. I've given up trying. It hits me in my gut. Mm. I have a lesbian niece. We love her wife. I have a lesbian second cousin. I first became aware of the discrimination against gay people when I was teaching at Dowling High School in West Des Moines. When a former student of mine, I was teaching a unit, the class was religious issues and I was getting to a unit on homosexuality followed, which followed feminism. And the former student of mine, whom I did know because she was gay, was because she was very active locally. And she said to me, I can talk in any school in, the, in this area except my alma mater. And that hit me so hard. I tried to get her to be able to come, but the bishop at the time we knew was a homophobe. So uh, the powers that be decided that was not the way to go. I, I ended up being able to bring in a sex therapist who really was not the best choice. And so just from that beginning of that time, and having educated myself and read a lot and overcoming a lot of my own homophobia, I just cannot understand why people think, A, it's a choice, and B, that, that, that they're not God's children, as much as I am, as much as we all are. So it hits me in my gut. Thank you so much for sharing, Sandy. Anyone else? Visceral reactions, physio, physical reactions. Hi, I'm Margaret. Um, I have two feelings, just spontaneous feelings at the same time. Sadness and profound anger. Anger that um, has been untapped for many, many years. And I feel like there's so much work that still needs to be done because the oppression is still so a part of my life. Um, I wonder when I, when I think about the situation, I wonder where all of our voices are. There are people that have spoken up, but just the everyday gal and guy are pretty quiet about this. And um, there's no support from the, there's little support from the people around us to come forward um, because we're deal, we just still deal with so much fear. And um, especially pe people from my generation who was were coming out before um, before the, the the liberation movement, and um, so that's that's what I feel. That sadness, so sad, and so almost paralyzed with sadness, and then then that rush of anger. Thank you. just added the question back on the chat and I might, as we're continuing to learn, we're unlearning together. And so I replaced minority with underestimated people. And I'd like to welcome that type of language as we're thinking about people who are um, marginalized, perhaps we can start to think of them as underestimated people, undervalued people. Um, I'd like to welcome any other response to this question, maybe one more before we move forward. 
I did raise my hand, so I will say that it it hits me in my heart from the standpoint that it comes to my heart from the standpoint that I have an uncle who has had a partner, the same partner for 52 years. And I've always just assumed that I, they were both my uncles. And I have a grandchild who is identifying as trans. And that was a surprise, but again, it's all with love. And, and to see the pain that has happened on both ends of the family that way, and to know that a ch uh, th this child who I brought to church for the first time when they were three months old is no longer welcome in the church that they grew up in is heartrending for me. Thank you so much for your shares. Pat, you want to you unmuted yourself? Yeah, I, I guess I just want to thank really all the marginalized <laughs> uh, and sexual. I just want to thank them because in my journey, I found more love from, from communities that I had not had experiences in. And I just recently had an experience. And I must say, I, I felt so affirmed and loved. Um, it's sends me to Susie that um, that we intellectualize something so basic that we are all related. Native people, Native Americans say, if you cut your wrist, we all bleed the same color. Native people do not have any distinction other than they have a distinction in the sense of honoring diversity among uh, gay and lesbian, lesbian in their in their ceremonies, and they welcome them into the ceremony, and really expect them to bring their gifts in. And I've been at their sun dances and sweats where I've received from them far far more wonderful things than I ever have had sitting in a pew in the church. Not to criticize the church, but I think we've got a long way to go to realize that we are part of the human human uh, society. So thank you. <laughs> I thank you so much for sharing your personal accounts as well as your very knowledgeable of, of you know, uh, your religion accounts, right? I think if we can, I do would like I would like to invite you to pause, to take a moment, um, perhaps of uplifting. I love that Pat, you really helped to transition us into this piece of honoring folks who have been passed, who have been murdered, who are no longer here with us because of how they identify. And I'd like to take a moment of gratitude for this community, for peace for their spirit, for their families, for society, for the perpetrators of violence towards this community. I'd like to name pioneers to uplift in this movement work. Um, Marsha P. Johnson, um, Sylvia Rivera, uh, two personal friends of mine who I worked with at a youth center who were murdered. Uh, I'd like to uplift Coco and Timothy. And I welcome you to close your eyes or bow your uh, head or gaze down in prayer and uplifting in intentionally and collectively thinking of these people with light and love. And for those who are also here alive for their protection and safety. I welcome you to take this moment with me. Thank you for taking that moment with me. I welcome you to continue to learn about these lives 
to allow yourself space to learn about these folks who are everyday folks who have also passed on for very silly reasons. I'm going to share <clears throat> my screen and I know we have some short time, but I'd like to uh, welcome your attention to just a few minutes, a uh, few slides um, that I have um, borrowed from a presentation uh, that I have created for uh, Just Harvest. So Just Harvest is an organization, uh, uh, spirit-led, Christian-led organization that I um, I support and I and I am a part of. Uh, more recently, just joined as a part-time person as a community wellness uh, coordinator there, and their their program feeds people every day. The idea is to eradicate uh, hunger in the community, and part of the program is engaging in just conversations. And um, part of this conversation today is thinking about inclusivity and what that means, um, how to continue to be an advocate and ally for yourself and for community. And so what does that mean, right, to be inclusive? Um, I think it's important to start that there is a recognition that people who have identified as lesbian gay, bisexual, trans, queer, and intersex, or asexual, or other, have historically experienced systemic oppression. I think if we are to think about what inclusion means, would, would you all agree to this first statement? I usually like to ask, given how sometimes this makes us feel. And even if we don't have the, you know, a collective response to agreeing, this is something that is real and that we can start with when it comes to facts. Inclusion can look like how we consider intentionally uplifting and accommodation, bring accommodations of people who identify in these groups. What does intentional uplifting look like? I think when when we're engaging in discernment, one of the things that I learned about this, the process of being open and inclusive is what is your intention? <clears throat> Sometimes people of privilege, like I would identify, I do not identify as LGBTQ plus. I identify as someone who is uh, straight, heterosexual, um, who questions at times and has questioned over the years. Um, however, I still am seen uh, as a cis straight person. Um, and so when, when I am engaging with the community, uh, part of my understanding is to understand that, that I have privilege first and recognize that there is historically, even though not everyone experiences mar marginalization or oppression, there historically exists. And so when working with folks, how do we honor their humanity and basic needs and, and really their voice um, and heritage? And how do we approach people with curiosity and so, instead of assumptions? These are some ways that we can think about inclusivity. Um, when we're thinking about understanding the differences, so this is a, just a little bit more education around the differences between gender, sex, and sexuality. Uh, gender refers to how people view themselves and interact with others. Uh, this is a social construct as we're starting to understand, more folks might be starting to understand and that this is a spectrum. A person's sex is based on their biology of their anatomical characteristics. And a person's sexuality refers to their romantic or sexual attraction to others. This uh, is a moment I'd like to welcome of just taking a moment.
How are you feeling with this information? I'd like to sometimes share with folks, pay attention to what you're paying attention to when you're reading about, sorry, some of these differences. And maybe if this was the first time understanding differences, how do you hold that? So if you need to take a moment to maybe write a word, where is it in your body? What are you visualizing? Maybe write it down. Maybe hold on to that for a second. Is there any resistance to this? Sometimes we can hear something new and not believe it at first, or maybe not want to understand it. Take a moment to pay attention to that as well. Uh, this is uh, the gender unicorn, just kind of it describes or maybe gives a nice visual for what I mean by gender, identity, sex, and expression. Uh, as you can see, we're understanding in mental health, and maybe Luan can attest to this, is that mental health is being seen more and more on spectrums. Where we started to see that development with um, learning disorders. Um, we might continue to see them more in trauma disorders. Um, we are hoping to see in the field more of this in when we're understanding gender or body. Um, historically, people who have identified as trans, for example, have been diagnosed in our field for having gender dysmorphia or body dysmorphia. Um, an illness, a mental illness means that you have an issue with functioning and you have a problem with maybe um, contributing to society. In order to have a mental illness, um, one would have to meet certain symptoms and also have problems with socializing or again, functioning in society. So it's not uncommon that in the, the well, in psychology or in the medical field, that if someone who is having a difficult time with their gender um, and not feeling comfortable or safe or being able to socialize or function because of how they feel inside, um, this would be something that's diagnosable. Um, we're learning more and more in the field of psychology that um, systemic oppression has played a very strong role in how we diagnose people. And learning more and more in this field means that we're trying to now shift to the, from the individual's experience to the societal experience and understand that systems have contributed to this issue. Um, most of you, or I'm assuming, and I don't wanna make assumptions, some of you might be very familiar with the history of um, uh, religion being used as a way to maybe pray, quote unquote, pray the gay out. Um, many people are actually still suffering from those traumatized experiences today. Um, these are the images of Sylvia Rivera, who is here, <clears throat> and Marsha P. Johnson, who is here with a beautiful flower crown. These are the two pioneers of HIV rights, harm reduction rights, substance use harm reduction rights, um, gay rights, gay marriage. They are two trans women who lived in New York City, um, and they organized not only for their right to exist, um, but they led uh, the way based on their platform and their beliefs and values to help us understand uh, what it means to be uh, more affirming to restore justice, um, also to understand how to have healthier communication when it comes to uh, sexual partnerships. So there are many things that we learned, uh, again, harm reduction. Um, these are lots of things that we learned, chosen family. So part of the community, someone mentioned, Pat, I believe earlier, is that you said that you never felt so much love, maybe affirmation than from this community and this community, uh, ballroom dancing and bold, right? Came from the black and brown LGBTQ plus 
community. So I, I wanted to add that layer. Some of you might see that black and brown color added to the flag. That's with intention to honor these, these folks who were the most underestimated people who created their own beautiful families, chosen families with mothers, with ballroom, with dance, with fashion, with love and care and, 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 and taking people into their home. Um, my experience of working uh, in a transitional living program that served LGBTQ youth was seeing and witnessing what it meant to, how important it was for folks to connect. The human nature of connection and belonging um, is what these folks have had to do to survive. Um, I will end with uh, this, also this person who I highly recommend to read their poetry, to maybe listen to their podcast, learn more about this person who is identifies as Southeast Asian, Alok Veb Minan, um, uh, Ben's gender and talks very openly about the oppression of trans people and people who don't identify in gender and talks very eloquently about the gender and the oppression of women and, and the connection between all of this um, oppression leading to capitalism and patriarchy and or stemming from, from those things and colonization and all of these things that we're fighting in social justice just all intersects when it comes to sexuality and expression. Um, I will uh, pause here to, again, take a moment. to see if there are things you can check in on receiving this information and see if anyone has questions at this moment. Part of this is really paying attention to where you're feeling, what you're listening to, what's sticking out for you and what you're also resisting. Here's where we might have a bit of an open sharing question and answer moment, perhaps. And um, I welcome you to answer this for yourself, maybe internally or externally, if you're comfortable. Um, what is my role in freeing myself from whatever holds me down, from learning about harmful systems? I've learned I really need to listen to myself when is anyone open to respond to these questions? I think one of the things that is really important is getting to actually know people <clears throat> who live a different lifestyle than you do. Mm. Um, it just, my idea of civil rights changed when I taught in Memphis in the mid 50s what those children were going through. Um, my, my idea of, of what we called at the time the gay people in the Noe Valley of San Francisco, when I taught there, my mother and father lived in the Noe Valley. And to see the kindness of the people, of the men who lived around my mother and father. Um, we had a very serious earthquake in 1989. And by the time I got back across, across the city, I had stopped at school to make sure the daycare people were okay. And then I went up to my parent, my mother's house. My father was gone by that time. Um, I, the, two or three different couples of men who lived around her had come to make sure she was okay before I got there and I only lived three miles away. They were the most Christian people, as far as I was concerned, mm -hmm. living a Christian life mm -hmm. by taking care of a woman who was in her mid eighties at the time. And so I just, um, 
I just have always appreciated that. When you get to know people, you stop seeing the stereotypes. You see people as individuals. And I just think we have to learn to open ourselves to know people mm. as people. Thank you. Uh, I see Amy. I'll jump in. Go ahead. Thanks. Your questions are powerful. And I um, I find as a, a supposedly a, a faith leader in a religious institution um, that so often my wishing to um, stand up for those who are in these kinds of oppressed situations or even just the language that we use um, is, is conflictual, right? So I want to support and uphold, but the actual system doesn't necessarily permit that. Um, and that becomes a real challenge one thing that I noticed in the um, uh, hospital where I work, um, we're, we're much better, I think, about accepting um, people who are openly gay, lesbian, where we're very challenged and don't have language and have very little willingness to um, accept is as we move to more uh, gender fluid um, kinds of um, expressions. Um, I hear my boss, our mission leader say, you know, I can get gay and lesbian, but I can't, I don't understand this trans thing. And, and to me, that's a, that's a barrier. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's not approaching the um, situation from curiosity or from a place of really um, coming alongside people but rather saying, you know, I just, I can't get you. Um, and I, I find that to be disheartening and challenging, um, but also a place where then I know I need to do a better job of, of stepping up and speaking up. Um, so anyway, that's, that's where those questions spoke to me. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, this is Marjorie. Um, I have a nephew who's been sharing his life with me since since the first big AIDS epidemic. Mm -hmm. And he is one of the longest living uh, people with HIV positive that, that has not gone into AIDS. And he's in big studies and all of that. So I've been very aware. I have nieces, nephews. I've got a gigantic family and almost every version is somewhere in my family. Um, we're just beginning to have the, the trans thing show up where young people think I want to be a male rather than female and such. And I, I don't have any problem personally accepting that. It just, I mean, it jolts me at first, I will admit. But um, I can accept that because I believe every person has a journey and, um, you know, I, it's not my journey. I, I'm to just go along with them. But there is one thing I'm having a really hard time is with kids who identify as animals or wear ears and tails and things to school. And they tell me that's rather common and has been for 20 or 30 years. So I don't know where I've been. But I mean, if anyone can enlighten me on that, I'd be very happy because I don't understand. And they they claim it's a gender issue. So I guess I have more of a question than a reaction. Thank you. I think that uh, if I could just respond to that, there's, there's something about the gender identity and gender expression that is kind of welcoming other things that make that people do that make people feel uncomfortable um in how they express themselves and I think it's kind of a it's kind of a slippery slope when we start to kind of put all the uh, all the maybe like strange behavior in like this big maybe bubble and really uh think about you know has someone with that as that has dressed like an animal 
ever been attacked or has been had laws placed against them um has ever been you know murdered on a mass level or, or even part of an epidemic like an HIV AIDS epidemic like I think adding these layers are really important when we when we start to think about some of the other things that people who oppose gender identity expression try to use as um, ways to kind of maybe confuse or conflate or minimize the the experience that that these folks uh, go through. Uh, this is this is Luann, and um, you know I, I think the way the question stated, what is my role in freeing myself, which is uh, part of our mission statement. Um, I don't know if you've always had that on the slide or if you did that for us, Dorian, but. Um, oh, it's always part of the journey <laughs> for every presentation. So that that's kind of coincidental because it's actually part of our mission statement that we're women called to free ourselves and help others be free in God's steadfast love. And and um, so I, I was thinking, though, about freeing myself and, and what my own barriers are, because I can really look at society and point out all the ills pretty easily. Um, the challenge for me can be to be honest about my own struggles. And, and I consider myself to be quite open and um, accepting and welping, welcoming and inclusive. And sometimes I have to wonder, okay, so what are my own barriers? And I, I think one of them is, is maybe concern or wondering about how my own privilege gets in the way sometimes. Um, that's one thing for me, I think. Uh, and the other one is what I always wonder what my own blind spots are, the things that I cannot see that I don't know about that's going on within me or in my interactions with people and, um, really wanting to have increased awareness all the time, uh, and wondering, you know, about, about, um, times when I might stumble through things that I don't understand. So those were some of my my thoughts on that. I, I see. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Mary. Um, one thing that began my freeing of myself was the film Normal. I saw it in, I think, maybe 82, but I got it from the library again because it touched me so deeply. I think it's Tom Wilkinson and Jessica Lang. Anyway, they were married for 25 years, and he felt like he was really called to be a woman. And that movie has, it's been one of the most touching, revealing, freeing of all the movies I've ever seen. So I keep borrowing it from the library. So that was my beginning of my freedom, which I'm still working on. Um, this is Mary Ann. Um, Dorian, at the very beginning, you... Um use the word listen and how important it is to listen. And um, for these two questions that you have up there now, um, I'm learning that one of my roles in becoming freed is um, not to run away from difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. um, that um, when I'm in a conversation and it's an invitation to really listen, listen to myself, but also to stay with the conversation, um, even when it gets hard. And um, if there's not an opportunity for that particular conversation to be developed at the time that I'm in it, to be willing to go back and actively um, continue it with that person or with that group. And um, that's become a very important praxis for me. I would just like to add, maybe this will be very disturbing, but to me, it's really essential. And um, I think as a religious, religious communities, or religious in general, but religious communities, we really have to begin to examine the systematic paternalistic institutional oppression that we have undergone as religious women in the church and are undergoing. And the limitations around that and really come to grips with that 
start, starting there, we can talk all around it, but until we really face for me right now, it's within the institutional institution I'm in, both in my church and country. But I have to start there as a person. As somebody mentioned the challenge of being in the church and, you know, I can say, I, as Luann said, she feels she's open, but how, how, how much do we talk about that in our community? That's my question. And how free do we talk about that? And how honest are we? Thank you. I started to say before that this is, was a really wonderful, wonderful issue of a National Geographic. Today is January 2017, and it's, it's all about what you've been saying. And I, I highly recommend it. The January 27 issue it explains, and uh, in, in biological terms, and it explains in different ways. And the people whose pictures they show you uh, inside, uh, they speak. The people of various ages uh, speak about what it meant to them when they finally could be who they really were. And it, 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 is, it really is so enlightening. And it, and, it, and it says all the scientific, biological things that, you know, these people who say, well, they just choose to be. They don't choose to be. It's so easy, are made. You know, and and it's, it's, I just really think this was really, really very helpful for me. Um, since you shared some media, some other folks shared some media, I'd love to welcome you all to a beautiful uh, two, two uh, movies or one movie, and which is a documentary. And the, docu the, the show is based off of this documentary. Um, so I'd love to share Paris is Burning, if some folks have not seen this. Um, that's a great uh, documentary. And then the that sh the show Pose was created off of that documentary. It is a show on Netflix um, that depicts the lives of what it was like to be trans, gay, LGBTQ, the HIV pandemic uh, during the 80s. Um, and so I welcome that as a, as a way to also connect with the, the very layered systemic ways that that lgbtq plus you know deal with not just within the community but also within society um and it is told from a black and brown perspectives and uh, again the layered um i uh identifying with as a sexual minority or underestimated person along with being a black or brown person or maybe someone who doesn't speak english um there is something to keep in mind, the layers that we experience aren't just around sexuality and the way we present ourselves. Um, what I do wanna share is how important it is to uh, feel secure in your identity, um, how whole and healthy it is for anyone to be uh, whole and secure in their identity. That is psychologically healthy, it's mentally healthy, to know that you're able to fully be uh, yourself and that it would be validated. Um, that is what we have understand as mental health professionals in this field. That's how we understand people who have experienced trauma um, is that the need to feel safe is one, very important, and two, the need to feel connected and validated and belonged are, are some of the most key ways that we understand the healing journey of folks and how to be a part of it. I think it's so important that we can visualize, you know, I won't read this whole statement, but visualize what it could look like to have unity and to have support and to allow ourselves space and opportunities for people to see beyond. So exposure like you all are doing today, meeting somebody like me, hearing some of the things that I'm saying are super important going out of your comfort zone is going to be really important. Meeting people um, where they are, uh, being a welcoming person wherever you are, perhaps being particularly nicer to a community that has experienced so much undervalued might be helpful to go above and beyond in creating uh, space and uplifting um, opportunities for folks with uh, these 
disparities of wealth, education, race, religion, sexuality, origin, and how we can continue to build authentic relationships with each other are ways that we can continue to build a just society and free ourselves um, and welcome others to free uh, each other. So thank you so much for your time, your space, your ears, your heart, your body, your eyes. Uh, thank you for welcoming. And I will pause here for a breath for myself and to see if there are any questions. This is Sandy Rodemeyer. I do. I am very upset with my diocese, the Diocese of Des Moines, because it has implemented a policy beginning in February that all children in our Catholic schools or in our religious education classes must be addressed by their birth name, must be identified by their birth gender with absolutely no understanding of what causes someone to realize they were, he or she was born in the wrong gender. I am livid about it. And I only have one person, my former pastor who listens and gets it. It's just, we're following the, the, the state of Iowa right now, which is not a place I think we should be following. Thanks for listening. Yes, Dorian, I don't know if you're aware, and some of you, you may not be aware that the state of Iowa has a, a proposed law that's in the House and in the Senate right now that would basically strip all people of their trans rights that they've worked so hard for identifying, including in the schools to just completely allow, disallow any generational or gender conversation before the third grade. And so it's those laws that are that are being proposed out there right now are just a real opportunity yeah. for us to be moved into action. Dorian, thank you so much for sharing this very important topic with us. And I am certain this conversation maybe is only just pausing and that this conversation will continue again. I do want to let you know that we do have the next date scheduled for our next Wero related speaker series, which will be May 21. And that'll be Mike Harvey and Rachel Gessinger from the Environmental Initiative. Loving source of all creation, you endowed all people with inherent dignity and worth and call us to honor and value their worth. We lament that too often the lives rights and freedoms of LGBTQIA plus people have not been valued in our communities. We pray that your loving compassion will transform the hearts of creators of fear. We seek your courage to reconcile with those who have been harmed by religion. I forgot to tell you, this is the ally flag that I found because uh, I think that we want to be allies. Dorian, have you any closing comments? Continue to be well in the struggle with you all. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Dorian. Thank you. Thank yeah. you all.